السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. so الحمد لله we're here tonight with our sixth part in our تفسير of سورة سورة مريم and last time on Saturday night we finished verse 22 uh, so we'll continue with verse 23 from tonight uh, but just as a recap so the last few verses we talked about on Saturday night was about uh, Maryam she withdrew herself which was verse 22 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in verse 22 that فَحَمَلَتْهُ فَانْتَبَذَتْ بِهِ مَكَانًا قَصِيَّةً that she, when her pregnancy became visible she withdrew to a place that was uh, far away and we said that she went to Bait Laham which is Bethlehem in English about four to six miles from Jerusalem and as we also mentioned that she went full term this is what the Islamic version of the story is that she went she carried him full term and then delivered him so inshallah ta'ala let's continue with verse 23 tonight فَأَجَاءَهَا الْمَخَادُ إِلَىٰ جِذْعِ النَّخْلَةِ قَالَتْ يَا لَيْتَنِي مِتُّ قَبْلَ هَذَا وَكُنْتُ نَسْيًا مَنْسِيًّا And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a date palm. She said, would that I had died before this and had been forgotten and out of sight. فَأَجَاءَهَا الْمَخَادُ إِلَىٰ جِذْعِ النَّخْلَةِ So while in Bethlehem and as her delivery was very close, the pains of childbirth, which of course any woman who has been pregnant, uh, she would know very well what this, these type of pains are. And of course, for us husbands who have been around when our wives have been pregnant, of course you also know. I mean, we don't, as men, of course, we can never feel what they go through, subhanAllah. But at least we see it in the faces of our wives. We see it physically, the amount of pain that they feel even before the delivery as it's getting close to the delivery, very close to the delivery. So the pains of childbirth, it drove her to go like hold on, hold on to the trunk uh, of a date tree. And so imagine this, that a woman, like imagine her situation. She is a woman who obviously never experienced this before. This is not her second or third or fifth or sixth child. This was the first time. Uh, she got pregnant, and of course, without a marriage, without any male intervention. She had no husband, she had no family members, she was completely alone. And she is in this pain of childbirth. The labor is fast approaching and she's feeling those pains. So imagine, and again, this is something that subhanAllah, that women truly, the believing women truly would understand the situation of Maryam. Imagine the sisters who are part of our community who are watching when you when you are pregnant with your child that you had nobody absolutely no one you're by yourself in your house no doctors no 911 call the ambulance can come nobody from your family absolutely no one around you you would think you're dead you're going to die like how am i going to survive this by myself so that is the type of test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested Maryam with. So she was never part of anything like this. And this was thousands of years ago, right? Thousands of years ago. Even today, if, let's suppose, let's suppose uh, you're driving a car or you're somewhere or something is happening and, and the woman is experiencing uh, labor pains or something. Somebody walking down the street might call, will definitely call 911, call the paramedics, and so on and so forth. Somebody will be there, but this is thousands of years ago. No one in sight, no family members, absolutely, literally no one to help her, uh, nor share, their, uh, share her experience with. She goes off to a place in Bethlehem, complete isolation, where people won't see her, won't interrupt her, or anything like that, alone next to a date tree. And at that moment, with all the pain that comes with uh, this final stage of pregnancy, she held on to the date tree and she said, قالت, She said, ya laytani mittu qabla hadha. She said, Would that I had died before any of this even happened. So this statement from Maryam expresses what, was, what she was feeling inside. She wanted that whatever was happening, if uh, to stop, to change. This is not something that she had chosen, 
right? Look at, think about Zakaria, the story that Allah had mentioned in the beginning of Surah Maryam. Zakaria, alayhi salam, his barren wife at that old age, they were making dua to Allah for, for her to get pregnant. Maryam here, she didn't ask Allah to give her a miraculous birth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her above all the women of existence. So at that moment, she said this, Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha. It wasn't that she was wishing to commit suicide, so do not get confused. Um, remember, during when we, when we first had our COVID-19 lockdown, one of the first lectures that I had given was about the fact that as Muslims, we shouldn't wish for death. No matter what happens around you, we don't go and say, Oh Allah, take my life. That's not something that we're supposed to do. And that's not what Maryam did here. Like for example, the hadith in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. There was, I mean, suicide in any shape or form is completely haram. The hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, وَمَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسَهُ بِشَيْءٍ عُذِّبَ بِهِ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمِ Whoever commits suicide, whoever kills himself in any method or with anything, that person will be suffering in the same way in the hellfire. So let's say somebody stabbed himself to death. That will be his punishment in Jahannam. The entire time in Jahannam, he'll be stabbing himself. Somebody jumps off a building and kills himself. In Jahannam, a person will be jumping off and killing. This is the punishment, non-stop. This is how he or she will be punished. Uh, so suicide in Islam is not at all in any shape or form allowed. Absolutely uh, forbidden. In another hadith in Bukhari, this is a hadith Qudsi, Allah, the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah said, Badarani abdi, haramtu alayhi al jannah. My slave has brought himself to me before his appointed time. Therefore, I have made paradise haram for him. So, suicide is one of the most despicable sins, one of the major sins that any human being can commit. So don't think here that what Maryam is saying because she's feeling the pain, oh Allah, kill me, just take my life. This is not what she's saying. She said, Ya laytani, mittu qabla hadha, that woe to me, would that I have died before any of this has happened. So there's a huge difference. She's going through a trial, she's not saying, take my life Allah. She said, I wish I had died before this trial even happened, before anything had even happened. And the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, Muttafaqun alayh, narrated by Anas radiallahu anhu, meaning collected and agreed upon and reported in both Bukhari and Muslim, لا يتمنى ينا أحدكم الموت لضر أصابه. None of you should wish for death because of a calamity that befalls him. This is haram in Islam, even to make a dua, oh Allah, take my life. You can't. فَإِن كَانَ لَا بُدَّ فَاعِلًا فَلْيَقُلْ اللَّهُمَّ أَحْيِنِي مَا كَانَتِ الْحَيَاةُ خَيْرًا لِي وَتَوَفَّنِي إِذَا كَانَتِ الْوَفَاةُ خَيْرًا لِي But if any of you are really feeling the pressure of the calamity, then let him say, O oh Allah, let me live if the living is better for me in my Islam and my Akhirah, and give me death if death will be better for me to attain Jannah. That's what you're supposed to say as a Muslim, but you don't start wishing for death. Right? So understand here that Maryam, in no way, shape or form, was she wishing for death at that moment. And she wasn't looking for something to kill herself with. She was saying, I wish I had died before any of this. Not, I wish I died now. Big difference between the two statements. So what she said is, I wish I had died before any of this happened. وَكُنْتُ نَسْيَمْ مَنْسِيَّةً and uh, and it had been forgotten. Nobody would have remembered. Now, why did she say this? We know from the life story of Maryam, she grew up in ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She was worshipping Allah all the time. She had her own private mihrab. She was in a complete state of ibadah. Her whole life since her birth was dedicated to Allah. So, of course, someone who was doing righteous deeds her whole life, that's why she was saying, I wish I had died before. Meaning when I was already, I know that I'm doing ibadah. And she already had angels come and give her rizq from Allah. Fruits and, and, and food. She already faced that blessing from Allah. So she was really doing a good job. She knows this. 
So she was saying that I wish I had died before, meaning while in that state of righteousness, because she doesn't know what's about to happen. What is going to happen to her? So she was confident in her Islam or Islamic practices before and was hoping that maybe I would have died. It would have been better off. I would have died as a good Muslim. I don't know what's happening now or what's going to happen. وَكُنْتُ nasyam mansiya, And people would have forgotten me. No one would have been asking me questions. Where did this baby come from? How did you get pregnant? Because this is about to come. So she was hoping that I wish I had died before. In that state of righteousness, in that state of ibadah, no one would have remembered me. No one is going to ask me uh, you know, really intricate questions about how this came about. So understand the context behind what she said and also what she actually said. She was not wishing for death at that moment. All right, so let's go to verse 24. فَنَادَاهَا مِن تَحْتِهَا أَلَّا تَحْزَنِي قَدْ جَعَلَ رَبُّكِ تَحْتَكِ سَرِيَّةِ Then, uh, and there's two opinions, and I'll get to that. Then either Isa alayhi salam or Jibreel cried unto her from below her saying, Grieve not, your Lord has provided a water stream under you. So who is that came to help her? فَنَادَاهَا مِن تَحْتِهَا Someone called out from below her. Someone called out from below her. There's two opinions. The stronger opinion, or what majority of the scholars have mentioned, Mufassirun, that this was Jibreel alayhi salam who called out. Some opinions say that it was Isa alayhi salam. When he came out, he called out to her. But the stronger opinion is that it was Jibreel. She hadn't delivered yet. She's about to. So Jibreel alayhi salam came and called out, Allah tahzani. Don't worry. Do not be stressed because here she is wishing. I wish I had died before any of this has happened. So then Jibreel comes to her and says, Allah tahzani. Do not be worried. Qad ja'ala rabbuki tahtaki sariya. Don't be worried. Your Lord has provided a, a, a water stream under you. You have water to drink. So she had no one to help her, no one from the human beings, her family, uh, friends, absolutely no one in complete isolation. But of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who gave her this test, the one who chose her above all of Nisa'il Alameen, from all the women of all existence, of course Allah is not going to abandon somebody. And this is something, brothers and sisters, you have to remember. If you are doing something for the sake of Allah, no matter how difficult the task is, or what is going on, you might think that this is, man, I got to worship Allah, I have to do this for Islam, I got to do this, I got to do that. It seems like very difficult task, that no one is going to help you. But you are doing something for the sake of Allah, Allah will help you, He's not going to abandon you. And this is clear proof. Allah chose her to give her a miraculous birth, Allah did not abandon her. She's in this type of pain, she's about to deliver. Allah sends Jibreel, and Jibreel calls out, there's a water stream, drink. So this is something you have to remember as a Muslim. Many times we find in communities, right? Corruption everywhere. Corruption everywhere, no, you know, too many corrupt people. There's so many bad people. If I, what can I do? Who's going to come and help me if I want to bring the justice of Islam? If I want to implement the sunnah of Rasulullah? If I want to establish the tawheed of Allah? No one's going to help me because everybody around me is corrupt. If your intention is sincerely for Allah, Allah will help you. He will. And you have to be confident. You have to have that tawakkul on Allah. It's not about the people. You could have a, a thousand people helping you out. But if Allah does not help you, it is useless. Or you can have zero human beings helping you, but Allah is helping you. You don't need anybody. This is something that as Muslims, you have to understand. We live in a time where unfortunately... Or, or sad to say, because we see widespread corruption, there's many Muslim men and women out there who themselves are religious. They pray five times a day, they're fasting, they're wearing the hijab, they're trying to learn them and their families. But however, they do not have the courage to speak up against corruption because they think, I'm going to be alienated in the community. They're doing haram, I don't want to say anything, no one's going to come and help me. Why do you think this way? That means you are not confident in what you practice. Clear as that. If you truly are sincerely worshipping Allah, why do you not have the confidence that Allah will help you? 
when you are trying to implement what is the religion, not something biased, personal. No, it's about the deen of Allah. Absolutely no personal issues here. It's the deen of Allah that we want to teach, the deen of Allah that we want to establish and implement. Like it who like it, hate it who hate it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely help. So take this big lesson from this specific verse, brothers and sisters, that there are so many uh, men and women, even our sisters, subhanAllah, that they might think uh, uh, maybe they're in an abusive relationship. Maybe they're getting zero help from the family to get out of the abuse. You stick to Allah. You do your ibadat. You improve as a Muslimah. You depend on Allah. You fight with Allah's help. You will see that everything will work out bi So let's go to the next verse, verse 25. And shake the trunk of the date palm towards you, it will it will let fall the fresh ripe dates upon you. Shake and shake the uh, date palm towards you. Pull it. So Allah provided for her water to drink because of course at that time a woman, she's going through labor. She's getting dehydrated. She needs water. Allah provides her the water. And then subhanAllah, وَهُزِّي إِلَيْكِ بِجِذْعٍ نَخْلَ She went near the date prom. Allah willed for her to go next to the date tree. And subhanAllah, you see here uh, what Allah says here that pull you pull, you grab and you pull the date tree to yourself. Again, every woman who has experienced pregnancy, who's watching, you know exactly at the moment, if you had a natural delivery, of course, at that exact moment, what are you doing? You're grabbing and pulling whoever it is, whether it's uh, in the hospital bed, you're, the woman is probably holding onto the two bars on the side and, and pulling. Or if it's the husband who's there, It'll feel like as if she's going to break your arm or something, right? She'll, she'll pull, pull you towards her. That's what happens during labor, right? They're pulling and then at, at the same time pushing the baby out. So this is why, وَهُزِّي uh, إِلَيْكِ بِجِذِعِ nakhla. Grab the, uh, the trunk of the date tree and pull towards you. Again, this is a woman who has never experienced anything like this. She doesn't know what to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides the help. Jibreel is telling her, teaching her, this is what you're going to do. This is what you should be doing right now. So pull that date tree towards you and you will see fresh ripe dates will fall for you. Dates are a fruit, subhanAllah. It's, it's a miraculous fruit that Allah has provided right in these desert lands. But the date, this fruit is full of energy, full of energy. It has sugar, it has uh, energy. And again, the woman who has, is going through delivery, going through labor, she needs water, she needs energy. She might have low sugars and things like that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides her exactly what she needs because He is Al-Khaliq, the Creator. He knows what His creation needs at what moment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided exactly what Maryam needed at that moment. She needed water, she needed liquid, and she needed energy. And dates are uh, one of the best, if not the best uh, fruits, you know, sources of energy. Let's move to, um, I mean, also you look at the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. So many times we see from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ from his biography, days would go by. He would just live off of water and dates. The Sahaba, days would go by, they would live off of water and dates. So dates has a lot of energy. Alhamdulillah. Then verse 26. فَكُلِي وَاشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنَا فَإِنَّمَا تَرَيْنَّ مِنَ الْبَشَرِ أَحَدًا فَقُولِي إِنِّي نَظَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيًّا Jibreel said to her more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَكُلِي وَاشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنَا So eat and drink and be glad, be happy. Eat the dates as much as you want. Drink from the water stream that Allah has provided for you as much as you want. Um, and be glad. وَقَرِّي عَيْنَا 
Let this be the coolness of your eyes. Like really, I mean, you are elated. Like this is, you can't be happier than that. So that's how glad you should be. Remember, just we just covered it tonight, two verses back. She was saying what? Ya laythani mittu qabla hadha. Oh, I wish that I had died before any of this has happened. So now Jibreel is reminding her, وَقَرِّ aina, Be very glad. Be glad. The best type of happiness that one can be. Let this be what just happened. Let this be the coolness of your eyes. Be happy. So Allah has just blessed you with one of the greatest messengers sent to Bani Adam. So be happy. Be glad that you are the woman that was chosen by Allah to carry such an immense burden, such a miraculous message, such a miraculous birth. And we see that Isa alayhi salam was, and we'll mention this again, but this was of course one of the greatest messengers. Isa alayhi salam was one of the five from Ulul Azam, the five greatest messengers. Nuh alayhi salam, then Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and finally Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. These five are Ulul Azam, the greatest of the messengers, greatest of the Anbiya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed this woman at this point with one of the top level messengers. Right? We can say, well, even being a prophet was enough. You're the chosen from Bani Adam. But no, Allah gave her one of the top messengers. So this is why Jibreel said, وَقَرِّ aina, Be very happy. فَإِمَّا تَرَيْنَّ مِنَ الْبَشَرِ أَحَدًا So, and if any human being approaches you, if anyone approaches you, because now they're going to see you're carrying a baby, people will approach you. Approach you. So if anyone approaches you, فَقُولِي Then say to them, إِنِّي نَظَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ صَوْمَ That I'm... Say to them, indicate to them, I am fasting. Verily, I have vowed a fast unto the most gracious. Uh, so, inni nadartu li rahmani sawma. Uh, I, have, I, I have vowed a fast for the sake of Ar Rahman, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mentioned before the, in the story of Zakaria, what did he do? That Allah give me an ayah. To know that my wife is pregnant. And Allah said, your ayah is that you are not going to be talking to people for three days. Also, the, as Abdullah ibn Abbas, Anas ibn Malik, and other companions, they explained in the tafsir of this verse. The psalm. Well, first of all, let's. I know Ramadan finished, of course, like a month ago. Shawal is now finished too. Uh, uh, but of course, you'll be fasting regularly or the brothers and sisters who fast the sunnah days and whatnot the word psalm is mean it means to abstain from of course in our sharia we are abstaining from food and drink and of course those of us who are married intimacy from dawn to sunset so you abstain from something you have done a psalm from such and such thing as abdullah ibn abbas and anas ibn malik and others they explained the fasting the siyam of bani israel was of course the regular fasting that we have, that type of fasting, but there was also, they were, their fasting, uh, they were fasting from food and drink, as well as fasting from speech. They did not speak to people. They used to take a vow of silence, as we see still today. There are many Buddhists who still do stuff like this, right? And that, but then of course the Buddhists, they, they act like such pious people, that they don't even want to speak. They are monks dedicated in the temple and their shrines. They're, they have dedicated to the, their lives to the great Buddha. But of course, then when it comes to killing Muslims, they're all fine and dandy with it, right? This is what we see in, 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 uh, in Burma. But anyways, still to this day, there are different religions that they take a vow of silence. Some might, somebody might say in a form of protesting, we see this a lot. I'm going to go on a hunger strike. That's not from Islam, right? Don't, don't ever do this. Unfortunately, we've become so accustomed to what the kuffar are doing, we find many Muslims also protest in the same manner. You, know, you don't have to follow the footsteps of Mahatma Gandhi. Follow the footsteps of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah will give you victory uh, through that, right? 
So don't go on any hunger strike or things like that to prove a point. That's, you are harming your own body, which is haram. But anyways, the fasting of Bani Israel, they would also fast from speech. So, inni nadartu lirrahmani sawma. Nadartu, meaning I vowed. I have taken a vow of silence for the sake of Ar-Rahman, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْ So I shall not speak to any human, human being this day. So if when people are approaching you, they see that you're sitting with a baby, you're carrying a baby, they're going to ask you dozens of questions. Simply tell them, I'm not speaking. I have taken a vow of silence. So now remember, all the while, she had gone off from Bayt al maqdis her usual place of worship, the private mihrab in Bayt al the sanctuary, of the haram. She left, she went to a far off place. She went to Bethlehem, Bayt Laham, and for however long it took. And uh, what's it, uh, her family, nobody was there. She was missing from her usual place. All the while, now all of a sudden, of course, people are going to approach her. Because people will be thinking, where did she go? It's been so long. She, she left Baytul Maqdis, she went off to a far place when the pregnancy became visible. So of course her family, the people, the rabbis, the people who knew her, they were going to look for her. They, where did she disappear to? Right? It's been weeks and months. Where did she go? So this is what's happening in the background. This is why Jibreel had to educate her. Uh, Jibreel had to educate her that when the people come to you, don't be worried. Don't be worried. This is what you are going to reply. The rest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of. She still doesn't know what the miracle I mean, of course, she went through a miracle right now, a miraculous birth, but there are more miracles to come, right? And so just do this when the people uh, come and approach you. So when they found her in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, she was sitting on the ground and, um, you know, she was carrying the baby, Isa alayhi salam. And when they came, they could clearly see her that she's carrying a child. She wasn't ever known to see with any child, right? And it's not that she's carrying somebody else's child, she's just playing with the baby that she found. You could, they could clearly see from her face that she is tired. And this is the type of tiredness that shows on a woman's face after delivery. So then they circled around her, clearly seeing that this is her baby. She just experienced childbirth. Then, now we go to verse 27. What does Allah say? فَأَتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ قَالُوا يَا مَرْيَمُ لَقَدْ جِئْتِ شَيْئًا فَرِيَّا فَأَتَتْ بِهِ قَوْمَهَا تَحْمِلُهُ So then she brought him. She was also there. She's also walking back at the same time. She's not in that place. She's coming back to Baytul Maqdis. Then she's sitting. She's taking rest. So when she brought the baby to the people, to her pe people carrying, the, carrying him, so she recovered, she's carrying Isa alayhi salam, she's, uh, she knew that she was innocent, she, ha she wasn't worrying, and Jibreel came and told her, don't worry about anything. And she already, from her childhood, she experienced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking care of her, providing her rizq, she dedicated her whole life to Allah. She, wasn't, she did not lose confidence in Allah. Like even when she was wishing for death before any of this happened, she was losing confidence in herself that maybe I will not be able to pass this test. She never lost confidence in Allah. She never lost faith in Allah, which is the sign of a true mu'min, that you never lose faith in Allah. So she has nothing to worry about. She knows that this is going to become a scandal. People are going to assume the worst about me. How am I getting a baby? Where did this baby come from? Who's the father? And all sorts of things. But she had faith. She knew everything is going to be fine. Everything went well with the delivery. Not a single human being was around her. She delivered. She was healthy. The baby was healthy. Everything was fine. So she was full of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and was confident that Allah would protect her. So this is why she was also going towards, back towards her people. Qalu. So when she came and the and her people came in contact. The, the, the first people to come in contact with her were her 
family members because they were the ones obviously looking where did she disappear to. It's been uh, quite a while. Qalu, they said, Ya Maryamu laqad ji'ti shay'an fariya. O Maryam, indeed you have brought uh, a thing that is fariya. Fariya means like a, it, it's unheard of. You know, this is shocking. We simply could not imagine that someone like you would do something like this. So it's something severely shocking, sinful. That's fariya. That laqad ji'ti shay'an fariya. Indeed, indeed, you have brought something that is of severe consequences. How could someone like you? It, no one would ever imagine that someone like you would go do this. What are they referring to? You committed zina and then you brought a baby. Where did this baby come from? Right? How can a woman have a baby without a male intervention? So they automatically assumed that she went and slept with somebody. And this is how the baby came. This is why they were saying that, Maryam, we know you were growing up in ibadah. You had your own private mihrab. So, لَقَدْ جِئْتِ شَيْئًا فَرِيَّةً Indeed, you brought something severe. Unthinkable. You have done the unthinkable. So, this was their first, uh, first reaction, the initial reaction. The daughter of Imran. Right? The daughter of Imran. One of the imams of the Jews at that time. She went and had a child out of wedlock. Amen. <laughs> what happens to us? Right? Qadr Allah many times. <clears throat> Allah chooses to test shuyukh and imams. Right? And, and I hope my, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects my children. But this is something that happens. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even tests the children of shuyukh and imams. I personally know some shuyukh whose children have left Islam. Some shuyukh whose son has been arrested for carjacking, for drug dealing, who have murdered, who have stole, who have done this. This happens. But what do the Muslims do? Ah, look at this crazy imam, crazy sheikh. He can't even control his own children and then wants to tell us about halal and haram. And I, I say to these Muslims, would you say the same thing to Nuh alayhi salam? Was it Nuh salam's son a kafir and died with the kuffar? And he lived for, he did dawah for 950 years, but he could not even convince his son to become a Muslim. Allah told us this in the Quran. So don't think that just because somebody is a sheikh or an imam, all his children or what's going to happen are also going to become shuyukh and a'imma. Right? Many people react this way. Of course, we hope Allah protects our kids, but... At the end of the day, when they grow up, they're individual human beings. We can only do so much, right? So many people don't understand this. We don't control individuals' brains and hearts. We can only convey the message. Just like every other person in any masjid. I can only tell the 30-year-old, 40-year-old man and woman that this is sunnah, that's bid'ah, this is tawheed, that's shirk. But I cannot force them to accept the religion or follow the religion in a certain way. I can only explain it. So same thing with our own kids. Once they become adults, we don't have control over them. They are independent human beings, independent Muslims, right? So this is how the Bani Israel is reacting. That Maryam, you, this is the daughter of Imran, one of the imams of the town. What did you do being his daughter, right? So by default, people expect more from the families of imams, right? And this is something... Also, from what I have seen personally, many kids cannot take the pressure. And that's what also drives them away from the sunnah and Islam. I know many brothers, many shuyukh, that subhanAllah, they have been doing da'wah work for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Some of their kids don't, cannot handle the pressure because people also don't know how to talk to them. So did you memorize the Qur'an yet? Did you become a hafid yet? Your dad's the imam, how come you're not a hafid yet? Because people don't mind their business. Why are you talking like this to the shiuch's children? You're not supposed to talk this way, right? Not everybody is going to be an alim, right? There are so many ulama whose children, like let's say from our generation, I'll speak of one sheikh, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, one of the biggest scholars of the past hundred years, right? Is every one of his children, of course, they're Muslims, good Muslims, they have their religion, they know 
a, a very good level, but he also has uh, children who have PhDs in Islamic studies and Sharia. They are also shuyukh. But are all of his kids shuyukh? No. So there are so many examples like this. There are other shuyukh. One of their sons is in the line of being a talib ilm Another son is a doctor. One of his daughters is something else. And then of course you also have some families which are blessed by Allah. The sheikh with his five, six children. All of them are also tulab and tulabatul ilm. Tulab, you know, talibatul ilm. Uh, male or female students of knowledge. Allah blesses different people differently, right? So be mindful of this and don't go overboard. Not everybody is going to be good at everything, right? So we have to always uh, remember that. Uh, because <laughs> culturally speaking, this is how everybody thinks. <coughs> Your father's a doctor, therefore you have to be a doctor. It's a shame if the son goes and becomes an engineer. How could you do this? Your father's a doctor. How did you become an engineer? Right? <laughs> so uh, get rid of that cultural uh, mentality. We want everybody, all our young people, men or women, doesn't matter. As long as you keep your Islam, your basic Islamic obligations, that's, you have no choice in that. You keep your basic Islamic obligations. Uh, then you go do whatever is halal. No problem. Right? Not everybody is going to be good at everything. So let's move on to verse 28. They said, يَا أُخْتَ هَارُونَ مَا كَانَ أَبُوكِ مْرَأَ سَوْءٍ وَمَا كَانَتْ أُمُّكِ بَغِيَّةٍ يَا أُخْتَ هَارُونَ O sister of Harun, who is this Harun? If you have been uh, tuning in uh, in, uh, in every lecture that I've been giving in, in, in this tafsir when we began, in the beginning I mentioned when we're talking about Imran, when we're talking about the mother of Maryam, and that Maryam herself is from the descendants, as it's been mentioned, the descendants of Harun alayhi salam. Harun was who? The brother of Musa alayhi salam. Right? He was the Nabi. Musa alayhi salam was the Rasul, and uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was the Nabi. I mean, uh, Harun alayhi salam was the Nabi. So from his descendants came Maryam. Ya ukhta Harun. It's not that Maryam had a brother named Harun. Right? Many, many people today, they read, oh, the sister of Harun. Who is this Harun? This is one of the ways of speaking. If you are someone who is righteous, you get attributed to people who used to be righteous that are also well known to be pious. Think about it. Uh, what happens when we see... Uh, People who are very corrupt. I myself, I say, who, who, did tell, who told you to do this? Your cousin the shaitan? Right? I, I, I say that a lot of times to people. <laughs> when they do the corruption. Right? Or somebody might say, oh, this guy's the brother of the devil. Or it seems like Iblis is his brother. We talk this way because when we see bad people, we attribute them to the shaitan. When we see good people, oh, this guy's the uh, brother of so-and-so or this or that. Who could be a pious person that we know about in the community, right? This is how we act, this is hum all human beings do that. So Bani Israel was no different. They're attributing Maryam to Harun alayhi salam. That's one opinion. The other opinion is that Harun was a pious man of that time. He was also a righteous man. And so they were saying, you know, you are as righteous as that person. So you're like brother and sister in terms of religion. So ya ukhta Harun. Your O oh, sister of Harun, this is like an attribute, you're attributing to the righteousness, right? It's not that she had a physical blood brother named Harun. So understand this. So there's two opinions. One is the fact that she was a direct descendant of Harun. So the people were saying, O oh, sister of Harun, meaning you're the descendants of that prophet and you yourself are righteous. How could you have done? And how could you have gotten a baby without, um, you know, out of wedlock? The other opinion is, that Harun was an actual righteous person of Bani Israel at that time. He was known for his piety, so they attributed her uh, to him. مَا كَانَ أَبُوكِ مْرَأَ سَوْءٍ وَمَا كَانَتْ أُمُّكِ بَغِيَّةٍ Now this is the next part. Your father was not a man who used to commit adultery, nor is your mother an unchaste woman. Neither of your parents are known to be fornicators and loose. Their character used to be, you know, really bad. Your father doesn't fornicate. Your mother doesn't fornicate. 
how could you do something like this? How could you have gotten a baby out of wedlock? This is a great lesson that we learn about human behavior, human psychology, human society. To this day, as we say, the fruit does not fall far from the tree. If most parents are unrighteous, they're un-Islamic, most likely their children are also un-Islamic. When we see young men, young women, teenagers, right, young adults, they don't know anything about Islam. It's because their parents did not teach them. This is known, this is human culture, the culture of all human races and, and tribes and nationalities. Your parents did not do a good job. Or if we see someone, a young child being raised with great adab, has tarbiyah, for sure the parents are involved. A child's not going to just come, oh, okay, this is what I got to do. No, the parents are the ones who teach them. You have to remember, parents are the absolute first teachers of any human being. Who's teaching the son or daughter? She, he or she does not go to school from day one. And even if they did, the parents have to do their job. Let's say your kids and a lot of parents, they are like this in the ummah today. I send my kid to school. I'm not going to check what he's doing in school. How are his grades? How are... I don't know if this... Does this type of stuff still happen? I have a couple of people here. Uh, one of them is a high school student. Back in the day when I used to be in school, I ha had to bring home the papers, the quizzes. My parents had to sign it. Well, I went to a private school, but that was the rule too. Right? So I don't know if schools are still doing stuff like this. Oh, they don't. Okay, all right. See? How? <laughs> So anything that will keep the children in check, they don't do it. So when I used to go to school, every test, every exam, we had to come and get our parents to sign it, right? So they would clearly see if you're doing bad or good. And then, of course, there's the parent-student, uh, sorry, parent-teacher day, which I know still happens. But even then, it's not as serious as what it used to be, right? And it's very shameful what is happening to the world today. We put money into killing and less money into educating, right? Look, look at this country, subhanAllah, the teachers are doing slave work. It's, 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 you are doing so much work, but you ba barely get any salary. That's why nobody even wants to be a teacher. All the money goes into military and this and that. What about educating the future generation? Like the school system really is terrible compared to other developed countries. But of course, that's a different topic. But the point is, brothers and sisters, from this, understand a huge lesson. We see here the people are bringing her parents into the comparison. Your parents are such good people. How did you do something this terrible? It teaches us a lesson. You are the first teacher in your home. You could be, and this is what I mean, like so many people, I send my kid to the weekend school, Saturday school, Sunday school, doesn't matter. And they expect that their son or daughter is going to become ulama. You send your kid to the masjid for two hours a week. And then you expect that they're going to become scholars of the religion. How? How is that possible? You have to teach your children. You have to bring your kids uh, to the lectures. You have to bring your kids to the masajid, to the khutab, uh, to all these durus, right? And this is one of the blessings in disguise during this COVID-19 lockdown for the past two, three months, everyone, subhanAllah, <clears throat> was forced initially, as a family, you're watching these lectures. Like these are your own words. So many brothers and sisters told me this from our own community. That before some of the youth, maybe, you know, and, especially, and here I'm specifically talking to our community here. Other people will not understand this. And may Allah save you from such type of stuff in your own communities, right? I mean, I don't wish these type of troubles for any Muslim community, subhanAllah. Uh, I mean, me being here for two and a half years now, so let's say the past three months, subtract that. So two years and three months. There are some young brothers and, uh, brothers and sisters that I have never seen their faces in the previous two years and three months. I have never received a phone call, never received a text message, never saw their faces. But subhanAllah, through this lockdown, because they don't have an excuse. What was their excuse? 
ah, there's fighting in the masjid, I'm not gonna go. Ah, oh, the previous imam was my best friend, they kicked him out, I'm not gonna go. Oh right? Those are the serious kids who use homework as an excuse. I'm talking about an actual problem that exists in this community. This is what was happening for the previous two years and three months. Then, uh, the, the, the three months that we had the lockdown, some of our young brothers, they are the ones, I don't know this, they are the ones who told me this through phone calls, through text messages. He's like, you know what? For the previous two years, I know you are the new imam in town. But I never came to listen to you. Never heard a single Juma, never heard a single lecture from you. I, I sincerely apologize to you, Sheikh, because this was not the proper respect. And I said, Why did you do that? And they are the ones who said, So much fights in the masjid, I didn't feel like being part of anything. Not, uh, who cares what's happening? And some others said, Well, the previous Imam was such a nice guy, they kicked him out, so we didn't really care. Right? Uh, uh, so the, an imam can die. You're going to give up Islam? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam died. Can you stop being a Muslim today? This is what happens to the pre-modern day culture of personality worship. I can die tonight. Those brothers and sisters who like me, are you going to give up Islam tomorrow morning? This is haram and this is a type of shirk. You're not supposed to love any human being to this extent. Not the scholars, not the imams, not the du'at, nobody. If you were to love anybody that blindly, it would have been Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet of Allah has died. Are you going to give up Islam? No, you don't. But this is where the difference between us and other people come. We emphasize on Tawheed. What type of love falls into the shirk category? You are never ever supposed to love anyone to this point that someone leaves, I'm gonna give up Islam. I'm going to stop praying. I'm going to stop learning. This is shirk al-mahabba. You're not supposed to do this, right? So, but the point is, brothers and sisters, this COVID-19 lockdown, it forced many of our young brothers from this community to come and listen, and then they see. Just the past two Jumas that we opened up, there were two young brothers that I saw. I have not seen them in two and a half years. The first time I saw them in Juma. And it was one of these brothers who've been watching these lectures during the lockdown. And it's good. And I, I hope more young, more youth, young boys and girls from our community will step forward. This is, we, we, who knows, because of nasty, dirty politics, what type of lies they heard even before I got here, which, you know, this is, which bugs the heck out of me, right? Even before I chose any of the groups, from day one, people already started causing nonsense, as if I don't know, right? So, so why will I choose anybody? You guys were, you took me as an enemy from the day I got here, right? Why? My job is to teach the religion, right? So there were so many things. Some of the young brothers and sisters in this community were told, I got rid of the old imam, and then I took his job. When you lie like this, why will any young brother like me? Why? I mean, I lived exactly 272 miles from this masjid before I came here. That's how far I used to live. I don't know about your fitna. I don't care about your fitna. I don't waste my life dealing with nasty racial politics. I have better things to do in my life, alhamdulillah, right? So these were the things that was happening. But, but alhamdulillah, through this COVID-19 lockdown, many families came together and started looking and watching learning together and it changes people when you do things so let's go back to this ayah let's connect everything Bani Israel was saying to Maryam your parents are righteous people how could you do something like this you stick to Islam as a family you practice Islam as a family this is what will inshallah ta'ala this is closer we can't guarantee anything in life we can't Right? Look at, again, I'm going to go look at Nuh alayhi salam. 950 years he did the da'wah. It wasn't that his age was 950, no. He was a rasul for 950 years. Still, he could not convince his own son. We can't guarantee anything. However, if you don't even try, you should not be expecting miracles. Right? You shouldn't. Parents are righteous. You call on your sons and daughters to watch things with you, then you will 
progress together as a family. That is the lesson here. So anyways, they said, how could you do this? How could you have uh, done this when your parents are righteous people? So inshallah ta'ala, tonight we will stop here uh, at verse 28. And uh, day after tomorrow, Wednesday night, again, we will continue. And then we get into the story of Isa alayhi salam directly, inshallah ta'ala. So let's uh, look at some questions.